We work in a cluttered, distracted world. Axios HQ is helping teams, both big and small, communicate more effectively and build trust. Colleagues get the news they need and nothing more to stay productive at work. Axios HQ, write less, say more. Communicators NYC is about to begin. We work in a cluttered, distracted world. Axios HQ is helping teams, both big and small, communicate more effectively and build trust. Colleagues get the news they need and nothing more to stay productive at work. Axios HQ, write less, say more. Welcome aboard. Please welcome to the stage Axios HQ co-founder and CEO, Roy Schwartz. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for braving the cold and coming out today. And thank you for everyone who's online and watching. Uh, we're really excited. Today is our first Axios Communicators event, and we're really excited to share all of the different ways that communications is changing. Uh, I also want to say a special thank you to Penta, who has helped us put this together today. Um, when Jim, Mike, and I started Axios, we realized that things were rapidly changing, that it was really hard to get the news and information that you needed, that with text messages, real news, fake news, tweets, it was just overwhelming for most people. And so we have to really think about how do you break through in this modern era? And so we created a new style, Smart Brevity. And in fact, we wrote a book about it. Uh, everyone can grab a book on the way out. Uh, we're happy to sign them as well. Uh, but it's a bestseller, and I think it is because people are realizing how much communications has changed in the last few years and how vital it is. In fact, we've built a whole company around it. So we've built a company called Axios HQ, and we're helping over 400 companies 
communicate in smart brevity, internal and external communications. We're really excited to have this conversation today because if you're heads of communication or you're just coming up in your career in communication, this is the best time to have ever been in this space because right now every CEO needs a head of communication as their right-hand person. Remote work, all of the issues that have happened in the last couple of years, it doesn't matter how good your vision is, how good your strategy is, if you can't communicate that to people, you are going to fail. So we've got a great set of discussions today. We're gonna to talk about how communications is changing, what you need to do about it. We're gonna give you tips and advice that I think you'll be able to take with you and will help you. And so with that, I'm gonna kick things off and I'm gonna invite Sarah Fisher to the stage. So thank you all for coming and we'll see you in a little bit. Welcoming to the stage, Axios Media reporter, Sarah Fisher. Hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us in New York City at Axios' first ever Axios Communicators event. We launched Axios Communicators to help guide communications and marketing professionals, PR and policy professionals, figure out how to communicate better. And it's led by Eleanor Hawkins, our top communications writer and strategist. I wanna remind everyone joining us today, either virtually or here in the room, to follow along using the hashtag Axios Events. And now onto the programming. Our first guest needs no introduction. She led Disney's communication strategy for over two decades, and she is considered one of the foremost communication leaders in the industry. I am excited to welcome Zenya Muka to the stage. Thank you, Zenya. We did not coordinate our outfits today. That is just a coincidence. It's a New York thing. It is a New York thing. Zenga, there's been so much news about Disney in the past few weeks, most notably Bob Iger, who you worked with for so many years as his communications partner, is going back into the company to lead the company and replace Bob Chapik. Why did you choose not to go back into the company with Bob and what are you gonna do instead? Well, two reasons. One, I just moved back up to the East Coast. I'm originally from the East Coast and I've wanted to do that for a very long time. Um, and I believe that retirement from a nine to five, 24 seven job, as we all who are communicators know what that is, that I needed a break from that at my old age. And, um, and I actually enjoyed the year that I haven't been doing the 24 seven. So I'm kind of excited about doing my own thing. I'm doing consulting. Um, going to be working with on issues and with people that I you know respect and like and want to try to make a difference doing some work with philanthropy and um, and I'm excited about a new chapter and really wanted just to get off the nine to five train consulting is exciting but I bet you there's a million people who would love to have access to your time and your brain you said there are certain issues and things that you want to dive deeper what's your ideal client now in this new role I think somebody who wants to make a difference in society, somebody who, you know, feels passionately about what they do and the business they lead and has a clear understanding of where they want to take it. And, you know, I think in my role would be to try to be helpful in trying to, you know, give them the what landmines they would, you know, anticipate. And given the role of communicators, particularly in these very polarizing, fast changing world, um, it's really critical to have that thought process, go into a lot of the things before you take action on them and really think it through and be able to go through the pros and cons and have those conversations before you come out with decisions that you know are not thoroughly vetted or, or thought out. Well, while we're talking about thinking through decisions, this has been a really tough year for Disney. Obviously, there was the Don't Say Gay saga. There was the saga with Scarlett Johansson and the rift between the Disney administration and the creative community. And then of course, with the markets collapsing, a really big pressure from Wall Street to be profitable, Invest activist investors wanting to spin off ESPN. What did you make of how Disney's year was going as an outsider, as opposed to someone on the inside who could actually change the course of those communications? <clears throat> well, it was... <laughs> 
I must say it was it was it was very sad. Uh, it was very disappointing. I felt um, you know terrible for the team that was there because I know how qualified they are and how professional they are, and and everything seemed to have been turned upside down. And I think most of it it was done in a way that didn't take into account establishing knowledge and establishing trust with the employee base, with your constituents, no matter who they are, and taking the time to really thoughtfully look at what it is that you wanted to do and what, in what stages that could be done in and how carefully you have to watch the brand. The brand, for, we have many brands, but obviously Disney is the biggest, no, I have to stop saying we. Um, Disney um, is the biggest umbrella brand, but there are brands within Disney that have their own identity, they have their own um, you know, way of how they do it, particularly the creative teams. You know, ESPN is one of the most recognized brands as well in of itself. So you have to be mindful of how you, when you're new, how you come into that space and how you treat those people who have taken so much time and so much effort in doing what they do and, and successfully, I must say. And so it, it was very disappointing and sad to watch, but I think now it's a totally new dawn, new day. And um, I think the first thing that's already happened is, but you know, Bob coming back in has, you know, brought trust back into management, which is key in particularly for a company like Disney. Um, the employees feel again as if there's someone there who cares about what they do, who they are, their contributions to the company's progress. And you know the amount of respect he has for those employees, as well as for you know the fans and, and the other constituencies that one always has to keep in mind when you're running a company like the Walt Disney Company. I want to go back quickly to the go "Don't Say Gay" situation because you mentioned something that was interesting, which is you have to sort of come in and do your homework and understand the legacy of the brand to develop trust. What do you think could have been done differently in that situation? Well, I think a little consultation before sending out an email of that magnitude. I mean, one of the things is in 1995, Disney was one of the first companies to establish um, giving uh, gay couples benefits. And this was, you know, how many years ago? And so we've had that history of having an incredible relationship with the LGBTQ community and to have it unravel in a day um, was, was you know, just kind of incomprehensible to, to watch. I think that experience was very hard to watch as an outsider, but you've also had to experience things as an insider that were very difficult. You know, one of the things I always think about was Bob Iger referring to how much he leaned on you in his book during uh, certain situations, for example, a small boy having a deadly accident with an alligator at the park uh, and resorts, what were the biggest challenges that you faced communication-wise that, I don't want to say parallel what happened with the Don't Say Gay Bill, but were up there? Well, the difference, I think, with the, what, with the accident with the alligator and the little boy was obviously something that was not of anyone's making. It was a tragic accident. And the the way that the company dealt with it was treating it as such, with empathy, with caring. You know, Bob immediately, you know, reached out to the family. The entire, you know, Disney family stood by the family and helped them. Um, we helped establish a foundation that the family now runs, you know, providing organ donations for children. Um, and we have a it, it was it was a, a tragedy, but the, the fact that you, as a human being, the leader of the Walt Disney Company, Bob himself, took responsibility for that. And then we took the necessary steps that were very clear about making sure that the signs the next time were very clear as to what you found in the waters of Florida, which people who live there know, but you know, tourists don't. Mm -hmm. And so it was important to establish take the responsibility, do what you needed to do to make sure that it didn't happen again, or you know, take as many precautions as you possibly can, and then you know, learn something from it. And we did all of that and, and show real empathy. And, and I think the difference on the other side was 
there was very little research done into how such a you know email that talks about politics, which as everyone knows, today is defined by depending who hears that word and what they believe in. There is no you know, finite definition of what is political. It's what matters to you. And you have to take that into account when you fire off missives like that. Would you say that that alligator situation was your toughest communications challenge? And if not, which was? That was the toughest situation because at the same time we were opening Shanghai. So you know, trying to open up for the first time a serious Disney presence and a brand that would live on in China for you know indefinitely while you're trying to deal with the situation back home, which and also that accident followed the, the you know recent bombing there of uh, the club in Orlando. So it was one tragedy after another. You mentioned that this moment is one where everyone's views of politics are different, that opinion is so divided. I think that's forced a lot more companies and communications professionals to take a stand on issues in a way they never had to before. What is your reflection on that? Do you think it's ever going to go back to the way it was? No. I Why think not? it's just, well, you're living in a polarized society right now. When that will end, you know, I don't think if anyone knows that answer, they would be, you know, the next whatever. Um, so I don't think you can predict that. But the second part is, is it's also the issues become part of your life now. And because of the polarization and people taking things that we used to think are right and you know, simply were right and wrong and were based on facts that you could support, now facts are not as relevant as they used to be. And particularly for communicators, it's very important, I think, to be able to come into the role that you have and the skills that you have to look you know, ahead and look around the corners to see what else is coming and be able to bring that point of view to whoever you work for and not be you know, knee-jerk, not be, well, today this is the popular thing to do. Well, the popular thing today may be the, not the most popular thing tomorrow and the backlash is probably greater than taking a position right away. So I think you have to do your research. You have to take a look first and foremost what's right and what's wrong. And then secondly, what, how it matters and the implications are to your business, to your brand, to your employees, to your consumer base. And make that judgment at that time. And I think if, if a leader has the trust of the employee base and has the trust of the various constituencies that they represent, they'll be given time to make those decisions and be given the patience to do that, to do the analysis. Because you know what you care for. You have a set of values, and those values will always be first and foremost. And then the rest of it you know, falls under that umbrella. There are certain issues, though, that I think have become table stakes that most companies feel they have to talk about. Those issues are things like climate. But then there are others where I think they can get caught flat-footed. I think about the Roe v. Wade debate. Do you think a brand has to be prepared for every single issue? Should they be ranking them and prioritizing them? How would you organize that? I don't think they have to take a stand on every issue. I think you have to understand the issues and the impact of those issues first and foremost to your employee base. And what does that mean? And how are you supportive of that? So you don't necessarily have to be pro and con. But if it's something that matters to them, that's a, it's a right that they have as an employee, as a human being, as a person, then what can you as a company do to support that without wading into the political debate, per se? And you can, you can do both without getting your head chopped off if you do it carefully and thoughtfully and understand the ramifications of that. But I think you can't do that if you're not you know, a trusted leader if you haven't worked at establishing that trust with, with your uh, employee base. So obviously you're not going back into the Disney administration, but you're close with Bob, you were his confidant for so long. What would you advise him to do as his communication strategy coming back in in the short term and then thinking a little bit more long term for the next two years? 
Oh, well, I think Bob is well prepared to do that. We've been, <laughs> when we were there, we were doing it pretty well, so I, I expect that to continue. Um, you know, I think he's working on doing exactly what we just talked about, you know, reestablishing that, that, that employee uh, trust, uh, bringing back, you know, the importance of creativity to the company that, you know, lives on creativity, um, getting the support of the creative community behind him. Um, those are the, you know, very important things. Re undoing the structure that was choking, you know, the creativity process. And I think once those steps are taken, you know, you will see Disney going back to its good days again. But he has to do that against the backdrop of a harsher economic climate, layoffs, all of those things. How does that play into his communication strategy? Well, I think we've, you know, the company had been through a number of those situations. We were, you know, and I was, we went through 9-11, we went through the COVID, you know, the Wall Street and other, you know, interested parties will give you the benefit of the doubt if they know you have a strategy, you're focused on that strategy, and you have a plan, even if at times you get derailed by outside factors that are not of your own making. And, and people will, you know, are understanding of that and will give you a pass on that, it'll give you extra time. So I think that's built into that and how they view him. Um, so I expect, you know, that not to be much different than it was when he was originally there. Obviously, there are different issues that come up, but we dealt with different issues for years. And particularly when you're such a consumer-facing brand, there are so many changes that are going and so quickly that you have to be nimble, but you also have to be thoughtful. Okay, so at Axios, we like to end on one fun thing. What is your favorite Disney character or movie. I know you love all your children equally, but we want to know. You know, I honestly don't have one, really and truly, because and this is the third time I, I said I have to find one because I keep getting asked this question. So I'm going to have to revisit that. And have to, but I like them all. Diplomatic answer from the world's best communicator. Uh, before we let you go, at Axios, we write everything in bullet points. We try to keep things short and concise. And today, we wanted to just leave you with a few takeaways from this amazing conversation. I think the fact that you're enjoying your break in this new chapter is very admirable. But I'm sure a million people here are going to want your advice. So good luck weeding them out in the consulting world. Um, you said you were sad and disappointed to watch as an outsider looking in to what was happening at Disney. I think a lot of the creative community and fans of Disney probably felt the same way. But you're optimistic about Bob coming in and being able to restructure the company. I thought it was interesting that you said Wall Street will give you the benefit of the doubt and the time if you have a strategy. And consumers will give you the benefit of the doubt and employees will if you build the trust, which is super important. I did not know that Disney was one of the first companies to offer same-sex couples benefits. And that is important context, thinking about the past year with the Don't Say Gay Bill. The tragedy of the little boy with the alligator, thinking about how you deal with that along the backdrop of opening a park in Shanghai and the Orlando Club shooting sort of sets you uh, reminders that you can never deal with any one issue in a vacuum. And then last but not least, uh, I love that you said that you can't really have a list of issues that you have to prioritize. You have to think about what matters to your employees and then how you can support them. Zengimuka, thank you so much. We thank really you. appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Introducing our View from the Top moderator and Axios publisher, Nicholas Johnston. Hey, hello, how are you? Um, thank you all for being here. Nothing that Axios does uh, would be possible without the support of folks like you, uh, people who read and subscribe um, to all of our newsletters. Um, so I'm especially grateful for all of you out here tonight. And I'm doubly especially grateful for tonight's sponsor, Penta. Um, literally nothing that we do at Axios. The investments we make in great journalism, the events we have like that, the bar that I'm gonna get to when I'm off stage would be possible without the support of our partners and sponsors like Penta. So I wanna welcome up to the stage for a View from the Top segment, uh, senior partner at Penta, Mike Berlin. Mike, come on out. Thank you for being here. So we're talking a lot tonight about uh, 
a company's purpose Absolutely. and how to deliver that message. Uh, who owns a company's purpose? Uh, well, first of all, thank you for having us and thank you uh, for our new company, Penta, to be part of it. We're very happy to be here. Um, it's really simple. The CEO owns a brand purpose. And a good CEO is asking themselves, why does my brand exist and what am I contributing in today's society? So do most CEOs get that? The good ones do. And, the, and some of them learn it the hard way. But um, what we're seeing now is CEOs who understand what their brand purpose, who their key stakeholders are, and how to manage them, those are the ones that are getting it right, right and are performing. So I love conversations like this because you're probably in a room with a lot of those types of CEOs, both the ones who get it and the ones who don't. And so I wonder if you could paint us a, a picture, not to tell us any names or anything, of like an example of a, a, a type of leader who does get that and then the journey that you have to help the ones who don't get it go on. The good CEOs understand that having a brand purpose and understanding their stakeholders is a key to their brand's success. They're building it into their strategy plans. They're prioritizing their stakeholders. They're measuring them. They understand where they sit with them. And they uh, actively have strategies against them. A, there's no bad CEOs, but a CEO, them all, but, right. but, but a CEO uh, who's maybe not on it is reacting to a crisis, un, uh, is challenging themselves, how did I get there, and is trying to knee-jerk uh, to respond to why is my brand in trouble, why are my stakeholders questioning what's going on, and they're trying to come up with a calm strategy to something that is that is a bigger, uh, but is they're a bigger issue. The reactive calm strategy is something they should have already. They've been, been thinking like by the about. time they're calling you, it's too late. Uh, no, well, it's never we, too late. It's never too late. We're always. I mean, uh, you have to come to purpose and understand stakeholders um, as a, as an evolution. There's no CEO who sets out and says, "I've got 20 stakeholders. Here are the four I'm actively." But you, but they um, as you sort of build your business, it's now part of your strategy. You know, Nick, when you were in business school, or people who were in business school in the 80s, they were talking about shareholder value. You were trying to create the most profitable company. In today's world, in business school, they're teaching purpose, they're teaching stakeholders, and they're trying to give strategies to manage them and to, um, whether it's your uh, employees, your customers, you know, what have you. Yeah, but those kids in business school aren't gonna be CEOs for a while. You're dealing with the people who learned it the wrong way. So take us on. One of them just got arrested a couple of days ago, so that's not true. <laughs> well, get to that um, one then. Get, they're they're us, out there. Take us, on, take us on this journey of someone who was hyper-focused at Wharton on shareholder value and is now trying to understand that it has to be a little bit different. Um, you, it's not, you have to put um, profits were always number one. And now it's, why do I exist? What's the purpose that our company serves? And understanding to recruit the best talent, to, uh, to get people the best consumers to buy your products, to get um, uh, other stakeholders involved. You have to have this purpose because that's what Gen Z, that's what millennials are going to be looking for to, be, to buy your product, to work at your company, and to be a part of your brand. So to widen almost their lens away from shareholders to all these other pieces right. of the and business. Let's be clear. Shareholders are still very important. The aperture has widened, and the stakeholders have to be... I mean, shareholders prioritized. might care about it, too. The now. shareholders, they've always cared about it. Uh, and, and, and now it gives them a larger voice. Share, I, I don't think shareholders have always been totally profit driven. They wanted to be part of a great brand. And now a great brand has a brand purpose. All right, you convince the CEO. Yes. Right? That's not the end of the journey. The CEO is, is usually the beginning. Right. Um, what's interesting is that what the CEO finds out is that the team underneath has been thinking about it for a while and might have been resistant to bring it up. They've been dealing with stakeholder issues, whether you're dealing with uh, government relations, whether you're dealing with uh, employees, the, so it's HR, GR, um, policy. They've been dealing with them individually. What is great about our company, Penta, is now we're thinking of them holistically and having all the stakeholders lined up so that you can now get the strategy instead of having seven people own 20 different stakeholders, right. you can get it to one. Is that convincing job continue though? Because I imagine the same things they told that CEO when he was in school is the same thing they told all these other senior managers that you need to be zero focused on a single bottom line as opposed to this broader idea. It's never ending. Um, right. keeping, in, keeping in touch with stakeholders, understanding their priorities, and, and having the information go back and forth is a never ending process. I mean, we just heard about Disney, one of the great brands who we would have thought was on purpose stumbles so badly because they lost track of right. Of really why they exist. Do you, 
is there not even an element of making them realize that a purpose is important? Do they have to? Do they know what the purpose is when that conversation starts? Sometimes, like how much how much work do they have to do just to figure out like, well, what is the the the, the purpose, the meaning behind that? Yes, um, I think. Look, your purpose is for your re reason for being. It takes a while to uh, align all your different internal and external stakeholders. The CEO has to have the vision, and that's what I think makes a great CEO. Understands right. what that vision is, is able to then work with their team, but then understanding how to communicate it down and to get that alignment and engagement with the stakeholders is the trick. How important is the CEO as the messenger? Not that important. Why not? Because it has to, because it has to, the, the most important person in, in, um, uh, in purpose is your lowest level employee. It has to be all throughout the organization. Everybody has to know what their purpose is and be aligned to it. The CEO can proselytize, but everybody has to have it Inside and outside. So you don't counsel people to CEOs to get on Twitter and let all their most important thoughts and feelings shared. That would be 1980 style. That would be that would be Jack. Well, there's some who do that now. Yeah. But we won't get into that one. Um, what we talked about this before a little bit, and I love the framing you had on CEOs who are resistant to this idea, who are so like, no, 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 they taught it this way in business school. I don't want to change. There's something that will change their mind, and what is that? Um, well, there's two things that will change their mind. One is they'll see their peer group, they'll, their CEOs are on other boards, they'll see their pe peer group and they'll see those who are successful and they'll be inspired and they'll want to bring that into their organization. They'll ask, why is, why is this guy on all these magazine covers exactly. and going on television? Why is she so important in this? And, and, and the, or, the, or they'll see it working with their brand or they'll see it working in, in, uh, uh, in society in a number of different ways. So that's reason number one, a great inspired CEO. The second, Give me the better reason. <laughs> well, there's, no, the, the second reason is a, is a CEO that's reeling from uh, an issue that they never saw coming with a stakeholder who they didn't consider to be important, and yet they now realize that their brand is different than it was, and they have to adapt it. Or they see uh, employees reacting differently and starting to bubble up from, uh, uh, from the bottom and, and start to question why the brand is doing And they this. start to realize there might be real consequences of that. There's employee retention consequences or maybe your board's gonna get angry and then that's it for you. Uh, yeah, absolutely. There's, I mean, look, we saw during the pandemic and the Black Lives Matter and we've seen all the inclusion, we've seen issues. A performative CEO is on their way out. And it's just, it's just a matter of time. What, is, what do you mean by performative CEO? Who just, just says, who's, who's saying what he, what, who's, just says somebody right, saying what just they says think they want to be right. Heard. Yeah, just right? says what he thinks is right and thinks like he's checking the box or she's checking the box and you will be outed. There's no tolerance for performative acts. It has to be authentic. It has to be real. And you'll, and again, with all the different stakeholders, um, you never know which one's going to call you out. Right. So uh, Sarah got to end on one fun thing. I want to end on one fun thing, but I think our fun thing might be a sad thing. You know, don't name any names, but like, give us an example of a of a of a CEO or a company that just didn't get it. Like, what are the risks and how dense can you be about okay, this? Um, Take us into the room. Okay, I, I'm a I, I'm a senior partner at Penta, so I don't know exactly who you know who all our clients are. So I'm going to be careful <laughs> here. Um, look, it's a brand that we all interact with every Sunday, the National Football League. It's, it's, one of the, it's one of the most highest profile brands. We all have our teams that we love, um, and yet they have, they have so many important stakeholders and they can't seem to get it right. They're always reacting to a crisis. They're pink washing, they're performative. When will the National Football League understand its role with players, with fans, with the cities and communities in which the teams uh, exist? And I think we wonder, why doesn't the National Football League get it? Well, what is the, all right, in the minute we have left, let's do a little bit for free. What was the free <laughs> advice you would give at the very top level to, on, on, like, to, to, a, to, a, to an organization that is challenged like that? Uh, if I was talking to Roger Goodell, we all know he's the commissioner. The first question is, uh, maybe don't be so owner-centric. Under, under, it's not just about making the billions of dollars for your team owners anymore. You need to understand the hundreds of millions of people who are affected by your brand and understand where you stand with all these stakeholders and start to understand football's purpose. And it's not just about the TV contract. We could spend another hour just unpacking the rest of that conversation, but I don't, we, I don't think we have time. Mike, thanks so much for being here today and thanks so much to Penta for making this possible. Yeah, thank you. Hey.
And now please welcome Axios communications strategist and writer, Eleanor Hawkins. Hello. Thank you so much for being here for our special Axios communicator event. It's really exciting to see all of you in one room. And while I have you in one room, I would be remiss if I did not mention my newsletter, Axios Communicators. If you don't already subscribe, please visit axios.com slash newsletter. Subscribe. It comes out every Thursday. We go through all of these topics that we're discussing here tonight and more. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Dusty Jenkins, Spotify's Global Head of Public Affairs. Yeah. All right, Dusty, thank you so much for being here. You have been at Spotify for about five years at this five point. Years. Yes. And during your time there, you've taken Spotify public. You have survived a global pandemic. Yes. You have helped launch new verticals like podcasting and audiobooks. And from where I'm sitting, your strategy seems very proactive. Yet you have a CEO who is known to be very selective when it comes to media and external engagement. I think that's fair. Yes. So, so talk to me about that relationship. How does Spotify's leadership view communications? It's a really great question. And I think for the communicators in the room, you know that a CEO valuing the function and what we do is so critical to your success in the role. And so prior to signing up to join the company, I had lots of conversations with Daniel Eck, our CEO, because like anyone, I did my homework um, and I noticed he didn't do any interviews. And so I, I really pushed him on whether or not he believed in the role of communications and whether or not he needed a me in my case. Um, and what I came to understand and have, have seen through over the last five years is that he absolutely does. He's just not comfortable He's from Sweden, he's on the Shire side. He's not comfortable with the spotlight. He's not looking for the spotlight. That being said, he absolutely understands the inherent value of storytelling and talking to every single audience out there. And so he's not looking for me to not say something. He is looking for me to say something about lots of things through lots of different people and lots of different mediums. And so we have a blog that we populate with content every single day that generates about 14 million readers per year. We have a podcast that's listened to by hundreds of thousands of people that we publish every couple of weeks. We'll have a new episode tomorrow. So pick a topic and we're talking about it through all different channels. And sometimes that does include the voice of the CEO, but it is for the most part always we're thinking about it in a very proactive way. So talk to me about the internal audience at Spotify. How do you all value internal comms and what's What's your strategy for managing communications in such a large global employee base? So it's not news in this audience to say that internal comms is so important to every company now. But when I took the role, I was at Target prior to coming to Spotify. And when I took the role of leading internal in addition to external, I wasn't very excited about it because I viewed internal comms like many did at the time very corporate, very stale. You present things to an employee in a way that HR or legal would say it. And the reality is, if you look at our brands from the outside, no one's talking to their consumer that way. So why on earth are we talking to our employees that way? Do we think all of a sudden they're going to be more engaged by boring content than the rest of the world? And so we at the time at Target started to say, how do we make our voice internally feel like our voice externally? Which Target is known for its marketing. It's known for the wink and the nod. And so when I came to Spotify, if you look at Spotify, it's edgy, it's current. We're speaking to people in a way that is reflective of culture. We wanted to talk to employees that same way. Lots of companies say they value internal comms. At Spotify, it's the most important thing. And so our CEO is constantly doing talks with employees. We do unplugged, we call them unplugged sessions, which are ask me anything. We did one today. We are constantly giving updates. We're sharing audio with employees. We're sharing our wrapped. And so it is an ongoing dialogue. Zania had a great point earlier about trust with employees. If you only talk to them when there's a problem, 
of course they're not gonna trust you because then every time you go to them, they're going to immediately be defensive and think something is wrong or think that you're about to tell them something awful. And so by communicating constantly in the best of times and in the worst of times, all of a sudden it really is a relationship and that's what we're looking to build. You mentioned the Ask Me Anything. What were some of the questions oh, your today. employees had today? Yeah, so lots of fun things about Wrapped. We really did get to celebrate Wrapped as a big cultural moment, which we just went through. If you haven't heard of Wrapped, come see me after and I can tell you all about it. Um, so we, we definitely got into that. But employees are asking tough questions about the, the global economy. They, we recently talked about the need to be careful about hiring and to think about internal costs. And so employees are asking, what does this mean? And how do I think about this through the lens of what, what is Daniel doing? What's on Daniel's mind? What is he seeing that I'm not seeing? And then how are we um, benchmarking with other companies? How are we getting insights from those that advertise on our platform? And so lots of really good questions that allow you to click down into tough issues. And like any CEO, Daniel wants to be prepared for that, but he doesn't shy away from it. You mentioned the economy. Um, it's no secret that tech, media, entertainment is going through a tough time, and Spotify is kind of at the intersection of all of those things, right? And we also know as communicators that there's no such thing as a strictly internal message anymore. Most of the things you talk about internally end up external facing. So, um, I mean, there was news today, right, that you're gonna stop doing those podcast live events. How do you message that to employees without raising alarm? Yeah, I think, I think like anything, it, it's how, how do you help bring them along on the journey? Because I, I think what employees um, will absolutely see through is if you're telling the street one thing and telling them something entirely different. And so we always wanna be sure that our messaging is aligned to every single stakeholder audience. And like in theory, everyone says, yes, yes, I totally agree. But then when it comes time for earnings, you wanna put positive messages out there and yet you wanna tell your employees, cut spending because we have concerns. And so in theory, we agree. In practice, when you're writing the language, you can get crossways. And so we're really transparent with our employees about the performance of the business. Spotify is very fortunate that we're a very large global company. And so we're not just seeing growth in one part of the world. We're seeing it Latin America. We're seeing it Europe. We're obviously seeing the impact of, of what is a, a global economic issue. Um, that being said, we're being very proactive with helping them understand the state of the business. Obviously, we're pre-earning, so there's nothing I can say at this point in terms of how we're performing. But what I will say is what we continue to stress, both internally and externally, and that is if we continue to put out the best content, if we continue to have the best offering through podcasts and music, we will continue to see people come to Spotify. One internal note that ended up external was the memo around the Joe Rogan yes. controversy. yes. Talk to me about that, because right now you have three million podcasts on your platform and you want to keep growing to become the, the biggest audio platform there is. So talk to me about content moderation. I feel like it's a very tricky thing to balance when it comes to communication. So how are you thinking about that specifically when it comes to messaging? So I think anytime you're facing a challenge, and Joe Rogan, there's no question, was a really big challenge for us because you had what employees expected, you had what creators expected, you had what shareholders expected. And so to the point of different audiences and having one consistent message, what we had to do in the middle of that is what any good communicator does when they're faced with an existential crisis. You have to ask yourself, what are you for? What are you for? And it's really easy to say, we're for creators. What are you for? And so in our case, we decided that we wanted to be a platform that allowed for more speech. And so at the time, that was a very controversial opinion. And we also said we are not going to be a platform that allows for all speech. And so we are going to draw really clear lines in the sand around hate content. And so pick a topic. Anti-Semitism is one that's being discussed right now. We've removed more than 19,000 pieces of content around the world on anti-Semitism. It doesn't mean, though, that we remove every single negative podcast that's out there. And so we're constantly looking at that line around harm. And so you have to decide what you're for. And then you have to communicate that over and over and over again. In fact, it came up on today's call as we were talking about artists and their behavior off platform. Mm -hmm. And so we had to decide what we were for. And I think once you get really clear on that, then your messages to your very audiences, various audiences start to take shape. 
I want to pivot a little bit yeah. and talk about Apple. Yes, <laughs> Apple. So Spotify has, has been going after Apple for their controversial... Four years. Yes. So Four years. Yes. That's a place where you've been super proactive, and it seems like you've turned up the heat, along with other big tech companies, but it seems like you've turned up the heat a little bit on Apple. Talk to me about that strategy. Yeah. So I don't know how familiar those in the audience are, so I'll, I'll just take a tiny step back. Um, at Spotify, we love Apple products. I, I have an iPhone. I, I use a Mac. Um, so it's not a fight with Apple because we don't love Apple products. We, we do. Our issue is about the App Store. And so app, Apple charges a 30% tax. It's a tax on the internet because how we all access the internet today is through our phones. In addition to that, they won't let us communicate to our own customers. We're not allowed to tell you how to sign up for something. If we have a better offer that we're doing because it's the holiday season, we can't tell you that either. We can't tell you anything. And so when we were put Spotify on the App Store years ago, when, when we launched the platform, we did not have these roles. Apple did not have these roles. And so out, over time, they've changed the roles. Four years ago, we said enough. I will never forget, just the story as an aside, I was sitting next to Daniel Eck on a plane, and he said, um, you know, this Apple stuff, it, it's really become such an issue that it's, it's hurting how we run our business, and it hurts our ability to release products. They control every update. We're going to take on Apple. I thought he had lost his mind. I mean, my comms team at the time was 30 people, and I was like, Apple has a team of hundreds. Like, we're going to get squashed like a bug, not to mention that they're going to hold it against us and make it even more difficult to get these updates. Um, but Daniel is a very principled leader, and he believed in this fight. And so despite the fact that we were initially alone, we took it on. And now we are a chorus of many. And yeah. so lots of companies now are talking about Apple. So we filed a lawsuit against them in, in the EU. They opened up an investigation that's still ongoing four years later. It does feel like it's been a long time. And so we're continuing to turn up the heat because we just launched audiobooks. And lo and behold, Apple approved our update to launch audiobooks and then 10 days later rejected it and then rejected it three more times. And so like any company, we are going to fight for our users and for our right to build a business. And if you think about what this is doing to Spotify, imagine what it's doing to the small companies out there that don't have our resources, that don't have our voice. On Apple, it seems like they tried to upstream Wrapped this year by releasing some of their charts ahead of time. Did it work? So I just will, this is what I will say. I, I can't speak to obviously their strategy, but there's nothing more flattering than someone who copies what you're doing. Um, and so we were flattered this year. We saw it in a couple of different places. And as a brand who has been doing this for several years, we get excited to see the different ways that brands will try to emulate what we create. I would note that Spotify, and, and this is not to gloat, it just speaks to what a cultural moment this is. It was the number one trending topic in 85 countries around the world without us spending a dollar. Um, and so it's a really effective marketing campaign. I don't put it on, so I'm giving credit to those that do it. But it's fun to see what it creates. And if others want to emulate it, by all means, they should try. So I'm a big fan of Wrapped. I feel like it is a snapshot in time. It tells you a lot about your year. Yes. Um, for our one fun thing, I, I want to know about your wrapped. What did, what was your? Oh, this is a loaded question. Yeah, You're not well, supposed to pick a favorite artist. Give me a snapshot into your listening routine. Okay, so I, I have uh, two kids. I have a daughter who is in third grade and a son who just started kindergarten this year. And so one of the highlights of my day is taking them to school in the morning. And so in the morning, there's a playlist on Spotify, only on Spotify, called Wake Up Happy. And so I wake up happy with this playlist every day. I do turn on my explicit filter because every once in a while I'll get some Lizzo or some Lotto who has the song Good Energy. Um, so I have to make sure that with my kids in the car, like we're, we're, we're filtering out some of that. But it is um, the way in which I wake up every day. And so this year with Wrapped, we're able to tell you sort of what is your listening mood. And so mine is that I wake up bright, so I wake up happy. And then I go to bed a little quieter, so I listen to lots of dinner playlists, mm -hmm. some jazz, mix it up. Love it. Well, that is all the time we have. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.
Real quickly, everyone, we're going to take a short intermission, go refill your drinks, and we'll be back here soon. Thank you. Please enjoy a brief intermission. The show will resume shortly.
show will resume in five minutes. Please take your seats. The show will resume in two minutes. Please take your seats. Axios Communicators NYC will resume in 60 seconds. Introducing to the stage, Axios business reporter, Hope King. Hello, everyone. Hello. Oh, I got a tough job right now. Um, starting the second half and half of you are still drinking, which is totally cool. Totally great. We welcome you to fill up your drinks. 
and uh, taking your seat again as we start the second half of our program this evening. Um, we're going to shake things up a little bit here in this next segment of our inaugural Axios Communicators event tonight. I have the great privilege of introducing two guests onto the stage. And uh, it's very rare that you get to have the CEO uh, and his chief communicator um, talking at the same time about a topic that everyone here in the room, of course, is interested in. And so we're going to try to take a peek inside their relationship, the day-to-day -day and the strategy as well, long term. Um, so without further ado, please welcome to the stage the CEO of Volkswagen Group of America, CEO Pablo DC, and his chief communications officer, Cameron Batten. Hello, good to see you. Nice to see you. Hello, welcome. All right. So we have uh, we have the rowdier crowd now. So <clears throat> we gotta we gotta match their energy a little bit here tonight. Pablo, congratulations on being named to the role earlier this year, stepping in in September. Um, and the day that you were named was actually pretty, uh, I think, memorable for both you and Cameron. Take us back to the day when you met Cameron. Well, uh, thanks for the invitation. Hello to all of you. So I was named in September. Uh, a couple of days before September, they called me and said, listen, Pablo, you're going to take over the role and uh, be here next tomorrow. So uh, the first thing I did is we get in touch with Cameron to align all the, all the communications, right? Via WhatsApp, I think. Right, yeah, Cameron? via WhatsApp. Yeah. Well, you had a lot going on that day, Cameron. Yeah, we had a lot going on. We were hosting the board in Chattanooga. The, the global board, uh, the group board. We also uh, had an exclusive with Joanne and Axios uh, with Scott Kia, And uh, we also learned at the week prior that he would be moving to Scout and we would be welcoming Pablo. So all of that was combining in the same day. And I think we wanted to start the conversation with this example of how you met and, and to look back because I think it's really a symbol of what you have to deal with every day as the CEO, but also as the comms professional here of managing multiple huge announcements, huge products at the same time. How are you helping each other juggle the priorities? Well, I think first you have to be very vulnerable with one another. I think the first time I really got to know Pablo, I was managing the distribution of his organ organization announcement in real time in the back seat with my head of HR to the left and him in the front seat. And you're just doing it all in real time and paraphrasing it back to your your lead internal communicator. And this is all happening as you're transporting from one part of our multi-building facility in Chattanooga, Tennessee, where we make uh, a lot of cars, to another part where we were uh, hosting the board for a, a luncheon. We don't know each other because I didn't know Cameron personally. <laughs> so we had to coordinate everything online or on WhatsApp or on the phone. And what is your own preferred communication style? Listen, I'm very informal. Um, I'm authentic. Um, I usually don't follow the scripts or the little papers. The scripts. Um, it's great. I speak from the heart. <laughs> See, this is, this is what I'm talking about. Is it, is it great or is it a little scary for well, Cameron to know that you like to no, go off script? Cameron, Cameron is cool. Uh, he, has a, uh, he has an employee. His, uh, his name is Jonas. And every time I give an interview, he goes white or red because he gets really frantic because I don't follow any scripts. And then he gets tense. Well, but I, he's cool. <laughs> this is a high compliment. End of your review time. Um, yeah. I'm sure that'll go in there. But yeah. you, he's, you getting, he's, he's blushing. Yeah. <laughs> but, but this is this is sort of the the, the sort of personality that we're seeing, um, and it works, right? CEO personalities that who want to be out there, who want to be candid. It works with audiences. You are kind of a celebrity on LinkedIn. You've got 75,000 followers. You like to communicate. Yeah. What is your North Star when it comes to the message that you want to present and also the methodology in which you want to present it? I, I think everybody has their own style, right? So I think you, you cannot force or fake somebody that you're not. Um, so that's the, the basic principle. Um, and then I communicate in a simple language that people can understand. Right? We're a car company, some, sometimes it's too technological or too in, engineer or detailed, and I try to avoid that and simplify the message and try to put more on a human side. For example, in the last couple of days, um, I published some of my pictures from when I was six or seven years old playing football or soccer. Yeah? Um, and that personal connection is what people are looking for. Get, getting to know the person, getting to know who you are, 
what do you stand for? What are your values? And, and that's what I do. Did you send those pictures to Cameron before you posted them? <laughs> no, actually, you know, it, wasn't even, it wasn't even my idea. Uh, it was somebody who works for him, right? Um, so listen, Pablo, why don't we do this? I said, great, great. And that's why you need to have a, a close connection uh, with the communications team because they need to understand who you really are and not to communicate the way they are, but they need to adapt. So when I communicate, it, it sounds authentic. But where are the boundaries? I, I think there ought to be some boundaries because you are your own person and yeah. you're the leader, but you also have a company that you represent. How do you talk about where those boundaries are? Do you move those boundaries depending on the, you know, what, what the room is like, you know, the, the, the culture uh, and, and what people are really interested in at the moment? Yeah, I mean, I think it's contextual, right? I mean, it depends on the situation where you're in. Uh, obviously, you know, our first uh, debut with, with Pablo was with employees, right? We were yeah. getting uh, to know the employees and we've, we've gone a ma on a massive road show across North America, the US, Canada, Mexico, talking to dealers, talking to employees, talking to customers talking to the media, and I think each situation is contextually different. I mean, the first time we did a, an, an all hands to all 3,000 employees across the, across the region and, and, and simultaneously, we didn't have many slides. We just put together three slides, and then we gave, uh, we gave Pablo an iPad, and we said, we're gonna let the questions flow. And then, you know, it's up to us and him to set those boundaries. We obviously help pre-select those, but he also uh, leans in and, and, and lets that audience know, you know where he's feeling comfortable and most passionate about. And I think that's, that speaks to more of the authentic nature of his communication style. Do you feel that as a strong communicator that that was one of the reasons why maybe you were chosen to become the CEO of the Americas Group? No, uh, listen, um, what we've done in Latin America, that was the job that I had before, um, the unity of the team was critical in the turnaround that we did in Latin America. And w when you have, and I'm a football player, I still play soccer. Yeah. Um, you know, when you play team sports, you understand that the team spirit is one of the most important assets of an, an organization. Some, some people call it culture, yeah? So by having a team spirit, people that understand that you need to have a purpose, that you need to work together, that the, the company is above any indiv individuals, and that's what we did in Latin America, and I think that's why one of the reasons why they brought me here. Well, you also not only, of course, are in charge of America as the region, but Canada, Mexico as well. From a strategy perspective, as you're communicating not only to the public, but to your employees, how do you manage the different variations of the, the same message of an announcement, um, and how do you make sure that the trust translates across the regions? Well, first I would say uh, Pablo is very gifted. He speaks three languages. And so you have to be able to harness that across the region. I, I don't think our communications team was quite used to that. Uh, so we were now posting LinkedIn posts in two languages. We were doing press briefings and press conferences in multiple languages. I'm holding on for dear life. I can comprehend and understand Spanish. I didn't need a translator in Mexico, uh, but, I, but I didn't really understand some of the nuancing. And I think that's something that you just got to get really in tune with the deeper you go. Um, so I think that, that's, that's one piece here. Uh, and it, it creates a lot of color, you know, and an opportunity and creativity uh, to do storytelling with him. I can see when he lights up on camera and what he's most passionate and authentic about. Uh, obviously, football uh, is a very a key part of that. You especially know, now that Argentina is on the final. It's especially in Argentina is in the final. Yeah, yeah. And you know, as, as, as a, as a multi-year sponsor of the US men's and women's national team, like day two, we were on the pitch in Washington, D.C. with uh, uh, Cindy Parlo Cohen and the U.S. Um, Soccer Federation signing the Equal Pay Pledge. And like, that's day two. And so you have to capture those moments, look at what it means for your different audiences, and be able to tell that story very authentically. You know, going back to your previous question, um, I've been here, what, 90, almost 100 days, right? I think I spent probably 10 days in Washington, D.C., which is my base. Um, so having this style, it, you have a price to pay, right? So every time you want to be close to the people, uh, close to the operations, I visited over 40 dealers. We went to Mexico, Auburn Hills, Tennessee a couple of times. So uh, you need to be able to understand that you're gonna pay a personal price and you really need to enjoy doing that because not everybody's ready for the, to do that. Volkswagen has a pretty aggressive goal to outsell Tesla's 
uh, worldwide. Uh, a couple of milestones that you want to hit. I think 2050, you want to become the world's leading EV maker. Um, and then by 2030, um, you want at least half of your sales to come from EVs. What role does communications play and will play in trying to reach that goal? It's critical. Communication is critical. First, from an industry point of view, I mean, the US, the US is leading the way. Almost 6% of the total industry today is electric. This is a growth of 70% over, over last year, and communication takes a key role. Um, we want to more than double our sales by 2030. We believe that the electric market will be 50% of the volume by 2030, and want to be 55% of our volume into electric. So that's really aggressive. We will launch 25 electric models by 2030. So that's a lot to communicate, a lot to position uh, within our brand. And when you look at the kinds of people who are interested in EVs, they're a lot savvier. They're doing their homework. Uh, you've got all different platforms now, not just news media. You have people who are posting reviews constantly on YouTube of all the cars. I know as someone who just bought one that we were extensively looking at these reviews. You have influencers on Instagram. And uh, I wonder how you manage those relationships when they are so independent, these reviewers, these you know, uh, you know, bloggers and journalists. Yeah. You have to have a communication team that's you know, multi-stakeholder and going 200 miles an hour. They also have to have an appetite for uh, creativity and uh, invention. Uh, you know, I would say last year we did an AMA with Herbert Deese uh, on Reddit. You know, that was the first we've ever done that. We had a war room and uh, just experimenting in real time. And this is where you're getting really meaty, uh, difficult questions. And you're starting to realize, you know, wow, we've got to go a, 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 a level deeper you know, for this audience. And so we just had to bring in the right kind of spokespeople. So, we're, we're constantly identifying the right spokespeople to surround leaders like Pablo and our board so that whenever the click down is necessary, you're there. Right, but as an industry that you know has been around for, for decades and centuries, I mean, there are people who might say, I don't really believe in communicating this way, or you know, I think that we as engineers should uh, be talking about this component of the vehicle versus maybe the lifestyle version. How do you bring along maybe some of those who are a little bit stuck in the past? Mm -hmm. Well, let me tell you a story, too, because this has changed a couple of years. It started a couple of years ago. So we did an auto show in Brazil uh, right before the pandemic, right? And we had 25 cars in display in Sao Paulo, 25, great lineup. Um, and, you know, probably 2 million people go through the show on, in one week. And, yeah, we had a lot of foot traffic, but when we start bringing influencers, and people that do not communicate in the traditional way, then our stand was packed. And then I realized that we need to change dramatically our communications. And this is applicable in Brazil, in the US, or anywhere in the world, that yeah, you need to go technical, because that journalism continues to exist, but you need to go into the lifestyle in a different type of communication, because the world has already changed. It will not change, it has already changed. And when you look at those, again, just going back to the, the number, the sheer number of media the outlets that are covering you know, your products now, um, you know, my, my first job out of college was internal comms. So I, I feel your pain, right? When, when people get it wrong, and I probably couldn't even do your job, because if I saw mistakes, I would probably go nuts. But um, how, do you, how do you go out and try to correct you know, the narrative and, and some of the misinformation that's out there? Yeah, I mean, the team is 24-7. You know, all the time. I, I would say you put out a release, you put out a statement, you look at who gets it right, who doesn't. Then you go out, you correct, you make pick up the phone. I come from the school of pick up the phone. And literally, pick up the phone, pick up the phone, pick up the phone, correct, plead your case, uh, and make sure that the, the statement is right, uh, that your, your voice is represented in the right way, that that vacuum is not filled by you know, misinformation or inaccurate information. How do you go against a, a guy like Elon, where he takes up all the auction in the room, he's synonymous with the brand Tesla, if you're going up against you know, him in the marketplace? I mean, are you ever trying to like out Elon Elon in terms of getting media hits for yourself? No, everybody asks me that question, and I don't speak about the competition or other people. So, I mean, I just work for Volkswagen. I am my own person, so. And the reason why I ask is I think sometimes 
business leaders can look at someone like him or even yeah. a Tim Cook, and they look at them, they look to them uh, as an example of something that they are allowed to do in some ways. Do you get that sense yeah. that there is sort of a, a you know, slippery slope when it comes to, again, the boundaries that we were talking about earlier? Yeah, yeah, with all due respect, I look at my dad as an example. Uh, yeah, he's really smart out, outside of this world, but I have a different role model. Biggest pet peeves that you have when it comes to reporters? <laughs> wow. You uh, start, Cameron. Help me out here. We're off the record. Do, we're your, off the <laughs> do your homework. The amount of information is readily available. You know, uh, read a perspective, read, a, read an analyst report, read something before you engage. I mean, that is the, the biggest pet peeve, is coming yeah, with thoughtful you know, questions. E e even though I'm really informal, um, I do a lot of homework, so um, I'm never un unprepared, so I do a lot of reading. Uh, Cameron and his team keep me updated very much, and um, you know, every time I go to give a, a conversation or an interview, I'm fully prepared, because you never know what the questions will be, so I need to be fully prepared. Yeah. The other I would say is like just feeling heard, right? We are constantly in touch with them. And, and so I think there's a notion that sometimes because they weren't invited to an event or invited to a first media drive on a, on a new electric car that they, they weren't heard. And that's simply not the case. You have a finite number of spaces. And uh, so that's, that's kind of a... Everyone wants to be in the cool cars. That's right. Uh, last question. What do you need more from Cameron? And Cameron, what do you need more from Pablo? No, I think um, we're doing this now, right? I, I think we're in New York now, and we, we continue to be in New York and L.A. and in other media hubs just establishing Pablo as a credible source. And I think uh, he's getting acclimated to the American media environment, doing, doing it extremely well. And, uh, and I think just getting him out more and, and getting him in more in situations where I can see him shine and see where, um, uh, where, where he excels at. And I think that's, that's really where we're at. Yeah, so I, I need, I, what do I need from Cameron? I need to continue learn learning about the, the u.s market i mean today we spent all day with the media yeah from washington to here mm -hmm. um, i always asked okay i understand the concepts so what are we going to do about it what is the plan i need more speed uh what is the plan for 2023 yeah and next year if we sit back here again and we look back what will you how, how will you measure the success over the past 12 months for, for me, it's how far we move the middle, needle with opinion elites and you know, the general population on uh, how much you think of Volkswagen and that leadership category on EVs. And I think that's a real key, key aspect for us. We have some huge launches coming up this year, and I think they're exciting. I would want to be a part of that. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're clear metrics uh, in, in turn, outside or inside. So when, communica when I look at communications, it's not only the outside world, but I pay a lot of attention inside to our, you know, our employees. So you have many ways of... Uh, understanding if you're communicating well, if you know what is the culture, are we going the right way? Outside, I think it's easier to, to measure. Um, I think there are many areas that we need to improve. Um, all the things that we're doing uh, in the social communities in terms of work. Uh, we just added, added a third shift. We added 2,000 people into Chattanooga. I don't think we communicated that well. So there's so many things that we can do better the fact that I'm saying we can improve doesn't mean that I'm criticizing. I mean, we need to improve every single day. Well, I look forward to chatting with you again in a year. We're checking on these goals. Cameron and Pablo, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Great to see you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so far. Go on. Yeah. There you go. Oh, on the front row. All on the front row. Thank you again. Um, we're going to uh, be resetting the stage a little bit for our final guest. And in this time period, I want to just talk a little bit about the newsletters that uh, we have. I have one. It's called Axios Closer. I write it with Nathan Bomey, my co-writer. Uh, and we cover all the big biggest business topics of the day. You can sign up at axios.com. And, of course, Sarah Fisher's newsletter, Media Trends. And Eleanor's, of course, is Axios Communicators. And if you are not signed up again, just go to axios.com uh, slash newsletters, and you will be able to sign up for all of them uh, right there. So we are coming to the last segment of the evening. I want to thank everyone again for tuning in online and for being here in person for our inaugural Axios Communicators event.
Our next guest flew here from the West Coast just to be here to talk to us tonight. Um, I have the really great privilege of, of introducing her. She probably needs no introduction. She has been a communicator in so many different aspects as a journalist, as an editor, and now as founder and CEO of the Ankler Media. Uh, please welcome to the stage Janice Men. How are you? How are you? It is so good to meet you. So nice to see you. Thank you uh, for, for, again, making the trip. And I know you've been back and forth uh, between the West Coast and the East Coast. So thank you for coming back. Thank you for, for having us. me. I'm so happy to be here. Absolutely. Um, so one of the things that I find you know, most remarkable about your career, and there's so many remarkable things, is that you were credited for turning around The Hollywood Reporter into yes. you know, this really glossy, aspirational magazine from a trade publication. And I'm wondering if you can start there and some lessons that you can share with us on how you identified the problem and the audience and how to really pivot. Wow. Okay, we have 15 minutes. Uh, no, we, no, we're gonna go longer than that. We're, we're the end. I, I think so. I think doing the Hollywood Reporter, it came. It came to me. It was taken over. Uh, it was bought um, through a group of assets uh, that were in Nielsen uh, by private money, um, Guggenheim Partners at the time, and some other investors. And um, they just all they had was this idea, and they approached me, and they said, like, we just want to make it. Fabulous, and I'm like, okay, um, I, like let's think about how we make it fabulous. And this was a time, and I think it really speaks to like how we all live in our own bubbles. And so I had lived in New York. I went to college in New York. hadn't left. Uh, my husband and I had two kids. We now have three at the time. And like we were like, let's move to California. We were thinking about Northern California, not Southern California. And um, and so they gave me this mandate. And um, and you know I thought about it for a while. And um, and I thought like. So there had been this long-standing trade press in Hollywood, but it didn't resonate with me as someone who lived in New York. It didn't resonate probably with a lot of people in this room. And uh, so I, when I looked at it as an outsider, I thought like, okay, I love the name. It's a great name. I don't really love anything else about it, but what can we do with that DNA and turn it into something else? And I thought like one of the best things, you know, I had worked, I'd been the editor of Us Weekly in the aughts and like it was, you know, super competitive celebrity news environment. It became this huge publication. Um, and one of the things I brought, I thought, to the staff that was the most effective thing was like bringing in a sense of competition and success. And I think that um, being able to introduce what I always call like a culture of winning, like, like you can you know, why are you afraid of being interesting? Why are you afraid of breaking stories? Um, they had all this access to, um, I would call it their own intellectual property, their relationships, um, you know, this entertainment industry that had become suddenly so much bigger and more important to the outside world than, than I think when you are living inside a system you don't fully recognize. And um, so basically we, you know, I brought in lots of people. There were like moving trucks coming from New York. I brought in a lot of people from New York to come work on it, to look to work on the look, the feel, like the website, all these things that um, New York with this long-standing publishing industry had a lot of expertise in and combined it with the sort of expertise of the staff, like long-standing trade journalists. And, um, and out of the gate, it sort of took off. And I, I think one of the biggest lessons of that also was like understanding your own personal um, tolerance for endless abuse by other media. Because <laughs> like when I, when, when in, there was like a three month period between when I started and when it launched and like, you know, it's a it, like the, the trade press out there was merciless. Like it's gonna fail, no one can save this thing. It's the Titanic, um, you know, all, like all sorts of things. And so sort of being able to tune out the noise if you're very sure of what you're doing. Right, and I th the reason why I wanted to start our conversation with this example is because I think many in the room and, and who are watching and going to watch is, is because I think a lot of strategists are trying to help their organizations overcome you know, something, whether it's to, to become you know, a, a bigger brand, have mastigia or whatever. And I'm wondering what you're seeing now in the industry that people are still doing wrong. Wow, uh, what am I saying that people are still doing wrong? Um, I mean, I think it's like, it's so it's, everyone wants like lightning in a bottle, right? And, and I think that um, it becomes hard, I mean, everybody wants it. We, even when, you know, there was much less media, um, when it was much less noisy. Um, but I, I like it, it's so, it always just comes down to fundamental things, do interesting things, right? And like, and also I think it becomes, and, and I'm guilty of this, 
at various times in my career, like don't like strip away things in your organization that don't matter. And so I think like doing the Hollywood Reporter, for example, or you know, Us Weekly then, it was like, you know, you people are interested in certain things and do more of those things. Like don't do more of other things. And like I think also like the emphasis on I think people really um, they're you know if you if it becomes very clear if you just focus on the audience or the or the consumer of your publication like do they care why would they care and like I, and i always was driven by this idea that you don't you never really focus on advertisers because advertisers will come if the audience is there and um, and you can't fabricate and i think there was a period in publishing where there were all these sort of like cynically constructed advertising uh, driven publications that they thought would fill some niche that didn't actually fill, like didn't, that audiences didn't care about. And I think trying to construct a publication for advertisers instead of for an audience or create products for, you know, for the wrong reasons is, is always, you know, misbegotten. I think a lot of brands are trying to reverse engineer, right? Yes. All the algorithms. I mean, you hop on a trend and someone is dancing in their living room today and eating Cheetos like another day. Like who can keep up with all of these insane things that are, you know, are also, by the way, are not lo no longer trending uh, after, you know, five I mean, days. I, there's nothing, there's no more painful, um, story that media does to me than like writing about things trending on Twitter or like Twitter responds to Elon Musk's tweets about, I mean, like- So it's that's just, your pet peeve about-, it, it, about it, like it, it drives me insane because it's not like authentic storytelling, right? And it also is, is cheap. I mean, it's, um, and I think, you know, people, everyone in this room has a story or something they heard that, um, they heard from someone and they can't remember who told them or where I read it, but I think I heard this. And like, that's like, that means you did not cut through, right? It was not memorable because everyone is doing that. Like literally everybody. Right. And one of the biggest lessons that, you know, you and I chatted about before today is this, this lesson that you've sort of learned over the past couple of decades of, you know, going away from the glossy curated perfected image into now like messy and imperfect and vulnerable. Yeah. I mean, I think like, so, you know, there's been this, I will use publishing because it's my industry as an analogy that just, you know, when I w was doing Us Weekly and it was a big thing, like this was the, like, almost peak magazines, not quite, but, um, but that, you know, everything, like there was this idea that you would have this highly curated publication, every photo, every caption, every headline, every color mattered enormously. And you would have these consumer marketing teams who would say, no, they love green, not pink anymore. And like, you'd be like, okay. And, and so everything was like sort of thought you could boil it down to a science. And that was also in the way like brands communicated with us, I, you know, um, Everyone wanted to have like uh, some perfect pitch to get their thing placed in. I mean, there, Us Weekly, there was, I think, an agency that created a, a, a prototype of the woman who reads Us Weekly, and she's like Amanda or like Abby or whatever. She's 32 and female, and she lives in a city. And like, it was really funny to hear about that, but that, that they thought, because if you had your product featured in Us Weekly, it would become like a bestseller suddenly because mm -hmm. there was so much scale. But so everything was sort of perfectly curated both on the in, intake and on, you know, in the output. And, um, and like, that's gone. Like, that's just gone. Like, both in the way that celebrities are portrayed, in the way that media works now, all gone. What is the kind of story that works for, for the moment that we are in right now? A, like an editorial story or? I, just oh. the type of, you know, if you want to be memorable, what is the right way to do that? Yeah. And what is sort of a way that's not sustainable? Um, so I think obviously like, I mean, I, as someone who observes a lot of campaigns, I guess out in the world, I just love anything that looks like it was done with some thought and, <laughs> and time, right? And, um, and uh, I think anything that evokes emotion, I think like, stories and i say this to everyone who i've ever worked with like stories are always about people they're not about things and they're not about trends like every single story is about people and um no matter how you boil it down and so how do you connect on a human level with uh with your audience i mean i think that's the fundamental uh essence of storytelling of successful storytelling on all ends of storytelling and where does vulnerability play into all of this? Um, I think that, that that's been a big shift, I think, in how people tell their stories. Um, and I, in, in some ways, like, 
even to, I would say, excess where like, you know, everyone feels like, I mean, I'll just, you know, I'll just, because it's the world that I work in, like, if you're an actor or actress, every single person knows that like it could be the hundredth interview they've done. And but if you talk about you know your anxiety, your OCD, you know your um, you know your injury, or right? like it's a it's a new way to relate to the audience. Um, but I think that it's it's no one buys the prepackaged product anymore. I mean, it's like you can I think you can look at like. <laughs> I mean, it's a, a, probably a bad analogy, but like at the boy bands or, you know, um, Menudo, if anyone remembers Menudo, but it's just like, basically like you could, like this belief that you could, there were interchangeable parts to this phenomenon and you could just change them in and out and you would still have the same result. Well, one of the things about having so much media, so many options for people to scroll and to read is that, like, as you mentioned earlier, people's memories are short. Um, when companies like uh, Balenciaga makes a mistake, uh, yeah. Um, when uh, a Tom, <laughs> when a Quentin Tarantino goes out there and says Marvel has killed superstars, um, you know these these generate the headlines in the moment. But how long will they last? I mean, I, I hate. I was actually having this discussion yesterday. Balenciaga is gone in a blip. I mean, I like, and um, I mean it's pretty horrifying. Uh, and uh, but I think that you could go out on the street and ask 100 people if they know about it, and most of them would not. Is that because there's more forgiveness from audiences and customers? Well, I no. I just think our attention spans are really short, and I also think that... Um, you know, negative attention is still attention. And, I, you, know, it, you know, that's been a, you know, as long as, you know, time has existed, that's been the case. Um, but... Uh, I, I just don't think I just don't think that um, anyone will have the patience. I mean, we are really like we're attention, you know, we're 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 all suffering from attention disorders, and I think that uh, like trust me, there have been a hundred other things that have happened that have replaced that in your feed. But then there is that other culture where people are showing up with the receipts and they're like, "Remember this? Remember this?" And then, you know, so it doesn't really go away. I mean, if it happens, it happens, and it's bad that it happened uh, and those mistakes. But even if we do forget, someone will always remember. Someone will always remember, but it might not matter. I mean, we kind of, we talk about this because this whole idea of cancellation comes up a lot in entertainment. And I would say entertainment and media have been the harshest on their own people in terms of cancel, like the so-called cancellation. And there are some people who are defiant, like, I will not be canceled and I will continue to keep going on and on. And, um, and it's been interesting to see how that actually works for some. So then do you think that brands should be less fearful of being canceled if the memories that we all have are just shrinking by the day? No, I actually think brands, I think that, um, I think people are more forgiving of human failures. I think brand failures are, are uh, stick with you. Like in a way that like brands can evoke memories about your childhood or like a, some memory of going to a dance or whatever, the, your first car. I, I think those are like much more powerful than sort of people saying like, who among us has not said something really stupid and, you know, hope that no one finds it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that's why you should never tweet. Right. Um, <laughs> what, what is the, uh, who do you think is the best communicator in your industry right now? Wow. Okay. So um, I will be say something controversial. I think that Reed Hastings and Ted Sarandos are probably the best communicators. Why is that controversial? Because, okay, well, it's controversial in entertainment because a lot of people in entertainment are perpetually mad at Netflix because they came and they changed the way of life for this like sort of cozy, clubby way that people had done business in Hollywood for a long time. And they came and they brought these Silicon Valley, they brought the Silicon Valley ethos um, onto this entrenched system. And uh, but Reed and Ted, you know, they, they're like, you know, you're, we're going to pay you what we're going to pay you for your show and you will no longer have a back end. Um, and you're going to like it and say yes. And everyone's like, no, we're not. And then they start, then they line up and start taking the checks. And then they make these declarations like, we're never going to take advertising. That is not our model. And then, then they start taking advertising and, you know, we're never going to release a theatrical movie. That is not our model. And then they, they put glass onion in theaters. And so, and it's fascinating to watch them because they apologize for nothing. And, um, and they actually like, um, when they were, when they had their last earnings call, 
And I want to talk about earnings calls because I think they've had a very destructive force in how we report about business. But I think when, when they had their last earnings call, not only did they, um, did they you know, report on their earnings, but they also started to just like dunk on the competition. Like, look how many more times someone, they, call, they, pull, they called up a Google Trends chart uh -huh. to show how many more people were I Googling. I remember this. Yes, yeah. uh -huh. they were Googling Dahmer, a show about a serial killer versus, I think, was it uh, House of the Dragon on HBO Max? And like, so that's like unconventional sort of, well, this is not the right word, but like, you know, unsportman-like right. to do, and they did it, and, but, you know, but... It worked. It worked. It worked. Wait, wait, why don't you like earnings calls? I think just in terms of, from media and entertainment, um, I think it's just changed the nature of how people communicate. Like, everything is about teeing up, like, the lead up to the earnings call, and like, it, it's all focused through, all the conversations are now viewed through the lens of, um, of, uh, like Wall Street, right. and like so, Wall Street has taken on this disproportionate um, influence in how we talk about content and how we talk about what these companies are and who these people are, and that that literally did not exist. I mean, even like five years ago. And do you think that's because there is an opportunity very regularly for transparency? You know, I personally love earnings because that's, you know, I get to look at the numbers and I get to see what they're saying. But most times CEOs don't want to talk unless it is during earnings well, time or it's the excuse they don't want to talk because it's almost earnings. Well, it, it certainly has shut down, I think, natural discourse among like, see, like, cause you, like, it's also a protective thing where you can hide behind it and say like, I'm saving it for the earnings call, right? right? And so, um, I mean, they're almost like following like the thing that entertainment has become, which is following a tentpole schedule where like you're just releasing like massive things, massive hits four times a year. And that's kind of what the quarterly earnings have become. There is a sort of rise of like the celebrity CEO, I feel like. Right? Yes. We know the Jack. We know the Elon. We know the Larry. I mean, do you feel that there is a way that we can kind of parse through their celebrity kind of facade and, and like see the real leadership? How do we know what's real and what's not? Well, typically it comes from leaks from the inside. You know, I mean, it's a view for better or worse. But I think that there is so much persona built up around the celebrity CEO at this point that... Um, uh, I think it's, and I think it's hard. I think there's also a whole level of press at this point that is like media fanboys, um, and it largely is boys, um, and that that sort of like almost a worshipful reverence for people in those positions. And um, uh, and I think that does like the sun is so bright it can block out like other reporting on the business. Shannon, so we have to wrap. But my last question for you: You've been a journalist. You've been an editor. You're a CEO now. How do you stay grounded because you see so much of what is happening behind the scenes of every of everything of every one the messaging so how do you stay optimistic how do i stay optimistic wow um i, I guess i just i don't i don't I guess you never drink your own Kool-Aid. I think like one of the things about founding a business, you know, at this point in my career was just like, you learn a lot of humility. Like I think anyone who's ever gone and had to raise money in a room, like <laughs> you, you learn, you feel humility out of the gate. Janice, it's such a privilege and honor to speak with you today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you to everyone here in the room uh, and for those tuning in. Um, sorry that we can't send you virtual drinks as of yet in the metaverse, we will be, but thank you for tuning in. We'll see you uh, later. Uh, for those of you who are here in the room, let's enjoy drinks and some more conversation. Thank you again, everyone, for coming.